The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Our guest today is Dr. Richard Carrier, and uh, some people might know him already and, and have heard him uh, from doing his uh, blogs and his many books on uh, religion, Jesus. Um, thank you for sitting in with us today, Richard. You bet. It's great. So, Richard, um, b b before Joe goes at you, I know he's got a lot. Um, what made you uh, get into the category of um, working and doing history of Jesus? Yeah, um, well, I, it started, of course, with just general counter-apologetics. I, I became an expert in resurrection apologetics, so I would debate and criticize and challenge all of these attempts to defend the resurrection as a historical event, the resurrection of Jesus, of course. Um, now, if you go even back further, how did I even get into history? How did I even get into that? It's a question of my philosophical quest landed me into organized atheism, and then uh, I fell in love with history as a subject, and I just sort of combined the two and said, well, if I do history, and I do history of you know ancient Rome, uh, Greece, uh, religious and intellectual history, then I could do things like criticize Christian apologetics and biblical scholarship, because I would know the languages, and I would know the culture, and I would have the skills and everything. And so I was basically that. I was just doing that for the atheist movement as, the, at the time, the only atheist uh, PhD historian. Uh, who specialized in antiquity. And so that was my thing for a while. Uh, and um, I've also, at the same time, I have two lives. One is the the philosophy side, too. So I also promote positive worldview thinking for atheists, and not just about <clears throat> what we don't believe, but what we should believe. And so I do a lot of philosophy, contemporary philosophy, not just ancient history. But this has led me into a lot of different tangents, you know, ancient science and uh, various other things. Um, but the big deal was when I got my PhD, I finally uh, got that diploma in 2008, and that's exactly when the economy collapsed. So there were freezes on hires for humanities majors, so there's basically no job market, uh, basically tanked immediately. And so uh, I went to my fan base at the time, and I said, well, uh, if you can cancel my student debt, I had about 20 grand uh, of debt to cancel. If you can raise the money like a postdoc research grant, I will apply my PhD to any subject you want and uh, just tell me what it is. And so uh, they raised the money and all the donors said, we want you to do like a serious exploration of this historicity of Jesus question. Does it hold up? Is it bogus? What what should we <clears throat> what should we think about it? And so um, they didn't expect me to give any particular answer. They just said, just apply your skills to it and we want to see a peer-reviewed book uh, seriously examining this rather than just dismissing it. And so that's what I did. It was a six-year project. Um, resulted in many peer-reviewed papers uh, and books. And uh, most the capstone project, of course, was on the historicity of Jesus, published by Sheffield Phoenix um, off the campus of uh, the University of Sheffield. And uh, so that... That basically sort of sealed my involvement in that. I, I was not particularly interested in the subject of the historicity of Jesus before that. I had written one article um, where I'd said, well, there are maybe some plausible arguments against historicity, but uh, there's really no, res nothing's been resolved on this. And most of the arguments are, are well, what I would call crank conspiracy theory nonsense uh, or amateur uh, inaccurate stuff. But there is actually, you can throw all that stuff out and there's still an argument left over uh, that there maybe wasn't a Jesus, that he actually started out as someone that people communicated with in visions and dreams and hallucinations and things. And then later they sort of created a story of him being a man on earth to sort of allegorize the teachings that they were attributing to this celestial savior. That actually is plausible. I think it needs a, a, a better, um, there needs to be a more honest and more serious debate in the mainstream biblical history community as to whether that holds up or not. Um, but there are also this, this whole halo of these internet crank theories about the non-existence of Jesus that I'm also fighting against. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, you know, I take it from both sides in this subject. So let me ask you, so you, you collected a lot of evidence to suggest that Jesus didn't exist. And, and if, if that was the case, then that's sort of a death knell in the heart of Christianity. Um, but, but there seems to be a pretty big scientific or at least historical consensus that Jesus did so when you looked into this what is the evidence that 
many historians sort of lean on to suggest that that Jesus was a real person, if there is any evidence, or is it just something they just take as a, as a truism without really looking into? It's a little of both. I mean, the, the reality is that we don't have a lot of evidence either way. Uh, so this is the problem when you've got this sort of vague situation where the evidence is deeply problematic, like it's heavily compromised, most of it's been destroyed, uh, it, it was controlled by historicists for a thousand years where they were deciding what to preserve, uh, they doctored a lot of documents. We know this for a fact. Uh, we have many, many, many examples of their efforts to doctor and alter documents, to destroy documents or make them go away or uh, forge documents, tons of forgery. Um, so this, and, and whereas all of the first century stuff, like when Christianity began, we have almost nothing, like virtually nothing survives from that period. So it's, it's really a black box. We don't really know, we don't have a smoking gun either way, either for historicity or for the non-existence of Jesus. And so when you see these ambiguous situations with really complex problematic evidence, uh, that's scarce for the period you want to study, uh, it leaves, you know, a lot of, room for biases to basically replace fact. And so I think there is a very strong bias to not go there. It's like a third rail in mainstream scholarship. Um, you don't want to be uh, embarrassed or lose social status or lose your job or um, you know have other people make life difficult for you if you're going to actually start promoting this as a mainstream idea that there wasn't a Jesus. So there are some, there's about 12 fully qualified experts with PhDs in a relevant field um, who have come out at least admitting that agnosticism about the historicity of Jesus is plausible and should be respectable. Um, so we've got, and that's increasing. That actually number has grown since I published the first peer-reviewed defense of the non-existence of Jesus theory in 2014. So it's, it's really, the theory's been around for over 100 years, uh, but no one had passed, no one had developed a peer-reviewed study arguing for it. It usually was just orbiting around in sort of pop literature and things like that. And I was the first one, thanks to the postdoc research grant that my fans developed for me, I was able to produce a proper peer-reviewed study of this subject. But what I found was the evidence is problematic. There's, there's, uh, there's nothing that is totally secure. Um, and so you end up with kind of a vague conclusion. I, my conclusion is there's a one in three chance that there was a historical Jesus, which is less than 50%, so it's not what mainstreamers want, uh, but it's also not that low. Uh, you know, one in three actually still leaves a distinct possibility that there actually might have been a historical Jesus after all. So it's it's an ambiguous outcome, which is what you should expect when you have ambiguous evidence. And that's the situation we're in now. The clues, though, uh, there's a variety of little things where there's these hints of these other sects of Christians who believe that Jesus was a myth, uh, that, or that the gospel stories of Jesus were mythical, and that there was something more cosmic going on, but all of their literature was destroyed, so we only have like brief references to the existence of them by the polemicists attacking them, and so there's and only a few of those. So, so it's, that's problematic. But the the big problem is that the letters of Paul, the the seven authentic letters of Paul, the others are forgeries. Uh, that's the mainstream conclusion. The seven what are believed the authentic letters of Paul, which were written in the 50s A.D., so about 20 years after the religion would have began are bizarrely silent about uh, a Jesus walking around on earth. They, they seem to only know about a Jesus you meet in Revelations, uh, a Jesus whose teachings you only learn through Revelations and through finding hidden messages in Scripture. Uh, there's no reference to actually any eyewitnesses seeing him while he's, you know, quote-unquote, alive on earth. There's no references to him having a ministry, to him being an exorcist, to him being a miracle worker, uh, to him teaching in parables. There's a lot of things, like the whole life of Jesus has been eliminated from this story, and there's only this cosmic tale of this sort of dying and rising uh, incarnate savior. So the question becomes, where did this, where did he acquire human flesh and die? Was it on earth, or was it in some sort of celestial realm? Was it in the sky? There's a lot of uh, uh, parallels, for example, in other religions around. The classic one is the neighboring province of Egypt had Osiris cult. Now, Osiris cult had spread all over the Roman Empire, so it wasn't just in Egypt. But it taught that there was Osiris was a historical pharaoh who did all these things and then rose from the dead and went up into outer space to rule from up, from above. But there were secret stories, and the, the priesthood taught that that was all allegory for what was really a myth, or really a, a, a the true cosmic story was that Osiris becomes incarnate in the sky, uh, in, in battles that the equivalent of Satan in their religion, gets killed by Satan and then resurrects from the dead and so on. So it's all taking place in the sky, not on earth. 
So that there were parallels like this. So there's a lot of these savior cults that had this sort of mythical, earthly version of the savior, and then the true story that would be told to insiders was that there was this cosmic being. So in context, that could have happened in Christianity as well. And so the question is, what evidence do we have? Do we have clues that, that prove this? Nothing conclusively proves it. It's just a question of looking at what evidence holds up. And most of it doesn't hold up. Most of it is clearly fabricated or unreliable. You, it might be 50-50 as to whether you can trust it, which means you can't trust it. You can't use it. So it's the, my finding is that it's very ambiguous, but there's a lot of suspicious clues that shouldn't be there um, unless uh, this actually is what happened, that Jesus was originally this revelatory being who was turned into a historical character later. And then, of course, the church that became powerful, that actually acquired uh, you know, access to Roman imperial power, was a historicist church, a church pushing the narrative that Jesus was an earthly man. And so that sort of altered the historical record for us because that church decided what documents would be preserved, which version, which dogma would be preserved, and so on. So at what point, um, because you mentioned that the, 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 that the early Christian writings don't talk about Jesus as a, as a flesh and blood person, but as somebody doing battle in outer, outer space, at what point do we start getting these writings that suggest that, that, that Jesus did exist on, on Earth? Well, they, it starts with the Gospels, um, okay. which happen after the Jewish War. So this is when a huge catastrophic event occurred. Uh, Romans, heathens, were allowed by God somehow to come in and completely destroy the Jewish temple, the temple of God himself. And so this is a huge existential crisis for, for uh, Judaism at the time. But it was also a big deal for Christians, too, but they were able to work this into their apocalyptic uh, view of the world. But then that's at, at that point, which is after 70 AD, uh, between about 70 and about 130 AD is the period when the Gospels get written. Uh, and not just the four that we put in the canon. <clears throat> there were a bunch of other Gospels. Uh, we know the titles of some 40 Gospels that existed. We don't have the text of most of them. But uh, all this stuff gets written between 70 and 130. Many of the other non-canonical Gospels get written in the following century. And so that's the period. So it's about, uh, it starts, I'd say, about 40 years to 50 years after the origin of the religion, which interestingly lines up with a lot of other uh, mythical people, the, the John Frum cults, the, the, you know, the cargo cults, um, the Ned Ludd. Uh, the mythical Ned Ludd became historicized within 40 to 50 years. Uh, the John Frum saviors became historicized in 40 to 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> the Roswell Flying Saucer and the finding of alien bodies, 40 to 50 years. So <clears throat> this period, about 40 to 50 years, seems to be a very typical time span for these kinds of myths to arise. So you, you mentioned in one of your uh, talks that you have posted online, um, you, you bring up Roswell and you say, well, here's what really happened. You have some sticks and tin foil yeah. out in the <laughs> desert. And then, uh, you know, over time, you can go onto Amazon right now, and you found thousands of books with some sort of story about um, what really happened in Roswell and, and, and what continues to happen in terms of a cover-up. Yeah. So how do you think that gets going? Like, 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 what is it that drives these these sort of things when there's really no evidence for it? Well, I mean, people don't really base beliefs on evidence, honestly. <laughs> uh, they, they, they base beliefs on what they need to be true and what, what resonates with them emotionally. And then they go look for any evidence they can find or create that will support their belief. Um, now, we invented science specifically because of this uh, trend in human behavior. We invented science as a tool to get around this really faulty way of forming beliefs. Um, and so the scientific method and, and logic and critical thinking, these are all overlays. These are like software patches that, <clears throat> and technologies that we invented to try and fix our broken brains that don't form belief systems on, on sound reasoning. Uh, but most people don't learn these tools, or, or even if they learn them, don't use them. And so most people are still using the same basically built-in hardware that the, the ancients had uh, before the invention of all these tools. So the question you have to look at is, uh, why do people need to believe these things? What, what, what role does it serve? What's the, what's the point of it? Uh, and I, I talk about this in, a little bit in my book, in the early chapters of On the Historicity of Jesus. We have examples like uh, the King Arthur legend. Why did people need to believe the King Arthur legend? And it was because the King Arthur legend became a symbol of a unified kingdom, basically the United Kingdom. And so this idea that all of the land should be unified under one became so associated with the Arthur story that anyone who denied the historicity of Arthur 
was someone denying that the kingdom should be unified. And so the, there was, they became inseparable in people's minds. And so there was this need to believe that it was a real historical event. And there's a, these kinds of things happen. You look at the cargo cults. Why do they need to believe it was really John Frum when we have anthropologists who are on the scene and documented that actually it was spirit voices communicating to shamans through telegraph poles? There was no John Frum. Uh, but within you know 20 to 40 years, they had this John Frum character who came to the island and gave them all their salvific teachings and stuff. Why? What's the point of that? Why do they need that? Um, and And... You know, that's a whole other galaxy of, of exploration in terms of sociology and anthropology as to why humans need reified, need their myths to be reified. Why do they need them to be literally true? Uh, and we still see people struggling with this. There's Christians who want the Bible to be non-literally true, but they can't get rid of all of it, right? They can't say it's all allegory. Now, there are some Christians who do. You look like John Shelby Spong and a variety of other, uh, Sheehan and a variety of other theologians are willing to go there. Um, Thomas Brody, was is one of the people who's argued that Jesus didn't exist, and yet he's still a devout Catholic. And in his memoir about how he came to believe Jesus didn't really exist historically, that it's all allegory, he has a whole chapter where he says, no, Catholicism can still be true with a non-historical Jesus because it's all about the allegory and the message that God sent through it and so on. Uh, so people can get there, but these views do not become very popular. Uh, the, the majority of people need like con need things to be concrete, I think. And why that is, that's a whole question in psychology. Um, and of course, I'm sure you've run into a lot of the psychology of conspiracy theories as to how they give people a sense of control when they don't feel in control of their world. There's a whole psychological literature trying to figure out why people are so easily seduced by conspiracy theories. I think it's the same psychology at work. So that was the next thing I wanted to ask you about is that you you have done serious work on the history historicity of Jesus, but there's a lot of unserious work on it too. And yes, is the movie Zeitgeist that got popular a few years ago? Quite and I think few, at this actually. point, That's yeah, I think at this point, yeah. yeah, they've done two or three versions of this movie. Um, and and I guess the movie sort of suggests that all religions are sort of based on the zodiac and the in the sun, and then you know the second half of the movie seems to link all of that into nine eleven, which is a pretty big leap. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's very and uh, yeah, something to do with oil con oil companies. Yeah, it's um, no, that one's pretty wild. Uh, the I only focus myself because my field is ancient history. I focus on the first half of that, uh, which is. The conspiracy theory about well, because there's a conspiracy theory in there, which is about how somehow the Vatican has basically run this conspiracy theory to suppress the truth, which is sort of true, but not really in the way that they think. There really isn't any good evidence for the uh, astrological theory of the origins of Christianity. Astrology works into all religions. You see it get worked into Christianity over time. They they integrate, but. It's not responsible for the origins of Christianity. All of this, finding these astrolog astrological symbolism in the Gospels, for example, is like tea leaf reading. It's, it's finding patterns that, that are just random. They're not really patterns that were in there on, on, on purpose. We can contrast that with like Mithras cult, which originated around the same time and is another salvation cult in the Roman Empire that was growing up. Uh, that we have very clear indications, uh, actual symbolism, actual texts, and so on, that, that show that it was astrologically based from the beginning. And so you can look at all the evidence we have for Mithras cult being astrological. You can look at Christianity, and, and none of that evidence is there. So you, Christianity is really just a Jewish apocalyptic cult. Its origin is based on the apocalyptic literature of the Jews prior to the origins of Christianity. It's basically just an offshoot of a bunch of these sort of fringe apocalyptic cults, these these sects of Judaism at the time, it isn't astrologically based. It's prophetically based. It's based on <clears throat> calculations in the Bible and things like that. So there are conspiracy theories that go in the opposite direction too. So I'm sure you're you're familiar with like Da Vinci Code conspiracy theories, where Jesus is is real, but he's all too real, and he's just a regular <laughs> yeah, he, person, winds up fathering children, and then right, he has a escape. dynasty. Yes, yes, that's that's another version of it. Yeah, you see, <clears throat> you see that version too. This other suppression of the dynasty of Jesus, suppression of the marriage of Jesus. This is another thing. There, there actually is no evidence, even if Jesus existed. There's no evidence that he was married, uh, and and no evidence that he was married to Mary, especially. 
Uh, and there was even this famous forgery that, that, that Harvard even tried to sell as or promote as authentic until they really got pwned on that one. Uh, the Gospel of Jesus' Wife, which was actually a, a modern a modern fake, uh, so promoting this this sort of mythic idea, modern mythic idea, not ancient mythic idea, of a married Jesus. And there seems to be when you look at people who promote these things, uh, we're really into the married Jesus, especially the dynasty, because the dynasty Jesus is a married Jesus mythology, right? Because you, you have to be married or have a, a a partner, a female partner, to have children. Uh, it all seems to be kind of a reaction. Uh, it's like King Arthur, right? It's a reaction to the Vatican's uh, anti-sex position and its celibacy and so on. The Vatican is, you know, promotes family and stuff, but it's really, in a sense, anti-marriage in the sense that its clergy can't marry, uh, it thinks marriage is only for procreation and so on. So you have this so-called so healthier idea of uh, sex and relationships. So you have the Jesus who had a, this, who's everybody admires. He's the hero, he's the moral exemplar. If he had a wife, well, now this repudiates the whole anti-sex position of the Catholic Church. It repudiates the celibacy commandments of the Catholic Church. And so people get attached to this idea to this. So it's like denying that Jesus had a wife becomes comparable to uh, associated with uh, supporting the Vatican's celibacy and anti-sex position. So there's, uh, and so you have this kind of the, the the revised new modern myth of the married Jesus becomes necessary to believe, or something that uh, you can feel good about as the one who believes it because everyone else is duped. I believe the truth, and it's the truth that, that takes down the Vatican and its whole ideology. That's how these things kind of operate. Um, there's no evidence for it, though. As a historian, you know, I look at this stuff, and it, it just, there's nothing. So at, at the end of your book on the history, historicity of Jesus, um, you, you, you come to the conclusion that it's possible that Jesus existed, it's possible that it isn't, and you, and you give it about a one-third shot um, that he really did exist. What if, what if it's true? What if he did exist? I mean, what evidence do we have about this person, and, and what can we possibly say about him? Well, we... Virtually nothing from the letters of Paul. There are a few passages in Paul that are ambiguous as to whether Jesus had family. Uh, for example, there's Paul references brothers of the Lord, which could be cultic brothers, because all baptized Christians were brothers of the Lord, uh, or it could be biological brothers. So that's ambiguous. If Jesus existed, then the possibility arises that those might be biological brothers, although there's there's some reason to suspect even that's not true. Uh, and various other things are like very vague, more like theological statements about Jesus, like that he had Davidic ancestry, but there's no statement about how they know, knew that or, or you know, whether he had a father or who his father was or anything like that. When you get to the Gospels, now the question is, these are highly allegorical, they're highly fictional, um, they're basically spinning out myths for literary and allegorical purposes, so there might be history hidden in them, but we, do, we can't access it because we don't have any tools that allow us to tell which things are said in the Gospels because they symbolize something and which things are said in the Gospels because they were true. Um, so there might be history hidden in the Gospels, but we just don't have any tools to extract it. The, the information we would need to extract it has been destroyed and it's lost forever. So, so that information is probably just lost to history for all time. When we get outside of the Gospels, there's nothing. The, the only stuff we have is stuff that's basically referencing the Gospels. So if you look at people talk about Josephus or Tacitus and uh, these other historians who are writing, you know, 60 to 90 to 100 years after the fact. Um, these historians, you know, first of all, there's also doubt as to whether the passages mentioning Christianity are even authentic. But even if they are authentic, they are basically referencing the Gospels. So they don't have any independent access to any true information about Jesus, they're just assuming the Gospels are telling the truth about st certain stuff uh, and then just repeat it. And so um, that's completely useless as evidence, right? So even if Jesus existed, we, we can't use any of that. We have no evidence external to the Bible that independently corroborates anything about the origins of Christianity. So um, that's what I'm talking about when we look at the evidence is deeply problematic. Um, we're we're kind of screwed as far as wanting to understand what actually happened at the origins of Christianity. We have to sort of use sort of detective's goggles to look at what clues survive, um, but even that's going to be tenuous. So you did the first peer-reviewed book on this. Did, has, has your work sort of sparked further interest in the topic? Are there are there more people, more scholars getting into it to to you know to examine this question a little more closely and maybe gather evidence, or um, is it sort of um, people just want to stick with uh, what the status quo is right now? 
Well, the majority, we've, we've gone through this before, I should point out. Um, when Thomas Thompson in the 70s uh, produced a dissertation that demonstrated that Moses and the patriarchs were mythical, uh, that they didn't exist, uh, there was a huge backlash from the mainstream scholarly community. They tried to destroy his career. They would get him disinvited from conferences. They would try to tank his papers. They would prevent him from getting hired. Um, and so there, it was. It was definitely the all hands on deck against this interloper who's suggesting this 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 third rail topic. We, we can't have that. Um, within 20 years, his dissertation, his thesis, has now became the mainstream consensus. Everybody now agrees. Well, yeah, actually, it probably wasn't a Moses or the Patriarchs. They're probably mythical. Uh, so it took about 20 years for that to happen. My my book only came out in 2014. So it's it's you know it's only been five years. It's it's still still pretty young uh, as an exploratory subject, but I am being treated much the same way. Now, I actually, there isn't any way they can harm me because I'm not interested in uh, making money off of the academic world. I, I don't want a professorship, and so they, they can't get me disinvited uh, or high, fired or anything like that. So they actually don't have any weapons against me. Um, but uh, what they do do is they will publish articles that like dishonestly misrepresent what's in my book, uh, in a desperate attempt to sort of discredit it or, or defend the historicity of Jesus. And what I find is it's people who, who aren't actually reading the book and presenting fallacious and incorrect arguments uh, in defense of the, the criticism of it um, is the main response to this, which I think is embarrassing and sad uh, and does not bode well for the public reception of biblical scholarship because it actually basically communicates to the public that they aren't doing honest scholarship in this subject. Now, having said that, there are some scholars who are interested in this subject. Uh, Raphael Lataster just got his PhD in religious studies in Australia, and he's actually... Uh, keen on doing more research uh, on this subject and, and, and is actually taking it seriously. There are several other scholars who've said that, uh, that, that, that more research on this is needed and it should be done in an honest way and are saying that the, they're, they themselves are agnostics or they say that agnosticism about historicity is, is actually tenable and shouldn't be uh, vilified or treated with uh, dishonest tactics. Uh, and we, I have a whole list of those 12 right now uh, on my blog, which is... Um, uh, Bart Ehrman uh, recap. So if people Google Richard Carrier and Bart Ehrman recap, uh, they'll find my main article that does all the, the debate that I've had with Bart Ehrman over this, uh, in the midst of which, you know, one of his claims is that there's no PhDs who, who agree with me on this, and actually there are 12. So, uh, so I actually document who they are and all of that. You can find that list there for people who are interested in this subject. So I guess one question I would have then is, are there PhDs who have studied the historicity of Jesus and sort of done works that come to the opposite conclusion that, that you have? Um, so are, when you went to do your book, were you arguing against um, evidence that has been brought forth over time, or were you really arguing against what just happened to be an assumption that historians have made? No, there's been, there's been literature on this that, yeah, so I just, like, earlier discussed how problematic the evidence is. <clears throat> We've actually known that for a hundred years now. Um, but the defenders of historicity take that crappy evidence and try to spin it out into evidence that confirms there was a historical Jesus through, like, fallacious methodologies, which is another thing. I wrote uh, the book, uh, also peer-reviewed book, Proving History, that examined the methodologies being used in Jesus' studies. And I found that all the peer-reviewed studies, and there have been many, uh, of the methodologies used to study Jesus, all of them, every single one, found that they are flawed and, and invalid, that they actually can't achieve the things that their users are claiming. So even the field itself sort of begrudgingly admits that it has inadequate methods to actually answer this question, but the field doesn't really respond to that, just keep trying to retool these same methods and keep using them because they want to keep defending this mainstream view. They don't want to go uh, to this dangerous third rail area. They don't all want to be Thomas Thompson. Uh, basically. So um, that's the status of where we are right now. Uh, so the evidence has always been weak. Uh, it's just a question of how that gets spun out into uh, defenses of historicity anyway. Like, how, how do they make do with the crappy resources that they have? So if I was going to argue to you in favor of the historicity of Jesus, and I had to explain why there wasn't more evidence um, contemporary evidence of Jesus' existence. Like, like, would I just be able to argue, well, people didn't write a lot of stuff back then, or 
um, maybe everything's been lost. Like, is there a way that I could get around sort of the lack of evidence? Definitely. Uh, I have a whole section on this in Chapter 8 of On the Historicity of Jesus, and I find that the lack of evidence is not a strong argument for the non-existence of Jesus. Now, it is a strong argument for the non-existence of a famous Jesus. Um, if, if you're going to make the argument that the evidence wasn't created or, or was lost, um, then the only way that's possible in context is if Jesus was a nobody <clears throat> whom hardly anyone noticed or cared about. Uh, and and all his followers expected the world to end at any minute, so they wrote nothing down. Um, <laughs> like so that that's uh, you, know, you these are there are plausible explanations you can come up with for why the evidence didn't survive, um, but they don't they don't support historicity either. They they just say that well the silence isn't, doesn't give us an answer either way. Like we can't use that to do much, but it does destroy the sort of glorious gospel Jesus. The gospel Jesus has to be mythical, even if there was a historical Jesus behind the gospel myths. The gospel myths vastly exaggerate his fame and influence, um, which would be, there's no way that that Jesus could have existed and not have generated a ton of contemporary evidence. And I give examples of uh, Socrates, Alexander the Great, Spartacus. Um, I, I, on my blogs, I, I, in my book, I give Socrates as a key example, and Alexander the Great is another. Um, but in, um, Socrates is a better analogy, actually, because Socrates wasn't a ruler who conquered half the world, uh, half the Western world, but... Um, <laughs> Socrates is more like Jesus, and Socrates never wrote anything, right? And he was this leader who had disciples, and uh, you know, so, in, so there's he's a, he's a better analogy. But we have so much evidence for Socrates that we don't have for Jesus, and that I I cover that in my book on the history of city of Jesus. Since then, everybody comes up with, well, what about Hannibal, or what about Spartacus, or what about this, or what about that? They always want to come up with someone, well. If what, you would have to deny the historicity of this guy, if you deny the historicity of Jesus, uh, so on my blog I've accumulated these. Uh, you know, I've done Julius Caesar, I've done Hannibal, I've done uh, Tiberius, I've done uh, even uh, I've got like paragraphs and stuff on Herod and Typus and and so on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've done this and I've shown that in all these cases we have better evidence for these guys than we have for Jesus, um, and that's just that's just the fact of where we are, and that. that could be explained by Jesus being a nobody, uh, being uninfluential, and that his, his story got spun out hugely just a whole lifetime later by fanatics who were still following his teachings, um, you know, 50 years after the fact. That's entirely possible, and that's that's where the one and three comes from. The one and three, if, if it's, you know, if we roll the one, <laughs> if we're rolling a three-sided die and we roll the one, uh, there was a historical Jesus, that's what it has to be. It has to be a Jesus who was kind of not even, there were a lot more uh, messianic pretenders who were way more famous than him and, and actually got into history books and he didn't. So he's basically just a minor nobody figure, um, which is entirely possible. I mean, there were tons of, almost certainly tons of people like that uh, who had their own influential followings. We know uh, the sect, at, like the Qumran sect, which predates Christianity, it had some sort of leader that they talk about, but, but we know we have no historical record of that guy. Um, he probably had maybe at best a few hundred followers in a region filled with millions of people. Uh, you know, it's like the, the historical record barely exists at all. So, um, and that's, we just got lucky because we found some of their shredded stuff in a cave. Uh, had we not, we would not know anything about them at all. So, um, so yes, the silence of the evidence is not really a good argument that Jesus didn't exist. It's just a good argument that the famous Jesus didn't exist. So I hear a lot of arguments um, from apologists that say, well, um, maybe the Jesus of the Bible is a story that got spun out of control, but there was a real person. And, and I have to wonder, even if that's the case, does it really matter? And then I also hear arguments, well, what if it's, what if it's, um, um, a few people in that the Bible is a story that's sort of a composite of several, you know, maybe messianic preachers or, or whatnot. I mean, I sort of liken that to like, you know, we found somebody named Peter Parker in New York, therefore Spider-Man's real. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where those sort of apologetics get anyone. Yeah, um, well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, the thing about keeping a door open, right? Um, I went to the Society of Biblical Literature conference recently, and I wrote up about it on my blog. Uh, and there's there are a lot of pastors and theologians and professors at Christian schools who actually don't believe in a real God. They don't think there's a person. They think God is a metaphor or something. But they can't say this 
as in their own words, we would get fired, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> um, so there's uh, so if you and so they they basically agreed to agree not to dis, not to ask anyone questions as to whether they believe it's real or not. Um, they'll just talk about what versions of God can they list in a book basically there's all these different ways to think about god but we are not going to say which one we we endorse um and it, it's allowing a door to be open so that you don't offend too many people so you can you can allow everybody to be comfortable and not freaked out uh and i think that's the similar thing here is if you allow there to be historical jesus well now he's a blank canvas that you can write any politics onto any any theology onto so everybody gets to have their own Jesus. If you want the revolutionary zealot Jesus who's, you know, sticking it to the man, you can you can believe in that Jesus. Uh, we'll, we'll allow that a place, uh, you know, in, in, in the mainstream debate. Or if you want the sort of crazy cult leader guru Jesus, you can have that. If you want the peace-loving philosophical Jesus, you can have that. If you want the conservative Jesus, the liberal Jesus, whatever Jesus you want, you can have it. But if Jesus didn't exist, well, now that kind of exposes the game. Now you're saying like, well, if Jesus didn't exist, he, it, everything's made up. And if it's made up, it, it isn't true. And therefore, any ideology I try to build on top of it has no has no ground underneath it. It's sand. It's going to fall away. Like, so you see, well, if you're basing your whole ideology, your whole vision of Jesus on this already fake Jesus, um, then your ideology is fake. Whereas if there's a historical Jesus, you can at least pretend that it's based on something real. You can construct your version of Jesus and say, ha, look at the evidence in here. This shows that my Jesus really did exist, and all this other stuff that's told about Jesus is all that's the the, the myth. And so you have these mainstream scholars do this. They'll they'll pick different things in the Gospels to be the myths, and different things to be the historical truths, and thereby cherry pick the Jesus they want. Uh, and so you have all these different Jesuses promoted in the historicity community, and there has been hand wringing about this. Uh, you, I, I quote some of this stuff in Proving History. A lot of scholars in mainstream. Jesus studies admit that this is a problem, that we have too many Jesuses <laughs> being promoted by mainstream scholarship. There's no agreement on what's true about Jesus. And there are some scholars who've come to realize that, well, maybe we can never know the truth about Jesus. And and so they're kind of dancing on the fringes of mythicism. But, um, uh, 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 Bermejo Rubio is one of these uh, scholars who's uh, basically said that, well, we probably can't know anything about Jesus, but he says, I think it's the zealot Jesus, and so he like argues for the, the, the violent zealot Jesus that got pacified, or got whitewashed in the Gospels. Um, but he still says, like, maybe we don't, maybe we can't know these things. And so there are a variety of scholars who are, are starting to say that maybe we can't reconstruct a historical Jesus and we should stop trying. Uh, and, and that would be in the camp of, it doesn't matter. If there was a historical Jesus, we don't know anything about him, so it's useless uh, information. But those views are still unpopular. Uh, they only barely skate by uh, as acceptable in mainstream scholarship, mostly because it's easy to ignore them. Um, but if you go around claiming Jesus didn't exist, well, now that that screws up everybody's game, uh, and you know that, that gives it away. No, no, one, no one wants that, I think. So, assuming that this that 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 the, the Jesus was real, if you were to come down and you know perhaps cherry pick your own Jesus, which which interpretation of Jesus as written in the in in the available evidence do you think is most accurate? The most defensible is the apocalyptic Jesus, um, which is uh, the one you can actually get evidence from in Paul. Of course, you know on the on the mythicist theory or the the one that I think is defensible. Uh, the the apocalyptic message of Jesus came through revelations. You would dream a, an encounter with Jesus and he would tell you this stuff. Or you would find Jesus had uh, inspired the prophets and so the words of the prophets are actually the words of Jesus in the Bible. So you would find these sort of hidden messages to find your apocalypticism. But if Jesus was a real man, he could have just been a, an apocalyptic preacher preaching the end of the world is nigh, you've got to repent now, you've got to do all of these things. Um, uh, because you know God's coming and the wrath is coming and you you know you got to get right with God, so he may have been like a you know a David Koresh type figure, or, uh, you know a, a Jim Jones type figure, um, who was like yeah like like just let people kill you or whatever it doesn't matter because you don't want to sin or else you'll go to you'll you won't get saved, but it doesn't matter if people torment you or whatever because God's going to come and burn everybody up anyway and you get to live forever so just endure. Uh, and be kind to each other, take care of each other in the last days, because the last days are here. And he may have been the sort of charismatic fellow that people just were like, yeah, yeah, this guy's speaking the truth, like the world's going to end. And so that's an entirely plausible Jesus. And you can find 
evidence of that uh, in the Gospels. And, you know, again, you can cherry-pick that version. But I think the reason it's the most plausible version is that you can actually trace pieces of evidence in the epistles of Paul. Uh, whereas the other Jesus is like the zealot Jesus. There's no evidence uh, in Paul, the zealot Jesus. Um, and, and so, you know, if that's the earliest evidence we have is in the letters of Paul. There should have been something in there. Um, and there's, there's other reasons to reject the zealot hypothesis. But I think the apocalyptic prophet hypothesis is the most plausible of all the Jesus theories but I wouldn't like outright rule out all the other Jesus theories. The evidence is so problematic that there could yet have been uh, some other Jesus like the zealot Jesus might yet be true. I just think it's not the least supported by the evidence. So in some ways this apocalyptic vision of Christianity is, is actually really popular even though you know I don't see people walking around every day saying the world's about to end. Um, I'll see them occasionally. Oh, they're, they're all, there's always yeah. someone saying, yeah. right? It's <laughs> like, if it, like if you go to Bourbon Street at night, you know, in New Orleans and walk around, there'll be one guy with a sign saying you're going to burn forever. And, you know, I bump into those people. But but in the background, um, those views are, are, are always there. So when we poll people, I mean, they always yeah. have these Manichean worldview where it's, you know, good versus evil right now and the end is coming and we got to get it right. And um, it, it seems like that view sort of has lived on oh, totally. you know, 2,000 years. Yeah, uh, I, I cite some books on it in, um, I think, on the historicity of Jesus. There have been several historians who studied the history of the end of the world. There's, there's at least two books on this um, where they, they go through the whole history of the last 2,000, well, actually in some cases 3,000 years, and apocalypticism has been around that long and just sticks around. When you, like you said, when you poll Christians today, I think a majority of them say that they expect the world to end within their lifetime, and have said this for hundred, like the last hundred years or something. So like, like every lifetime, uh, they think it's going to happen in their lifetime. And you can go in the history books and see that they've been doing this for centuries. Like you can go back to the, you know, a thousand A.D. The world's going to end in our lifetime. You know, a thousand years later, here we are. The world's going to end in our lifetime. Uh, you know, it's, it's the most falsified prediction in the history of human history, and yet it continues, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, it's sort of interesting because there's always these cults that say it's about to happen, it's about to happen, and then the day comes and goes, and then people don't <laughs> change their beliefs about yeah. it. They'll, they'll either say, well, our prayer, God answered our prayers and he saved the planet because of us, or... Um, God got angry because we found out and we're not allowed to know, so he's going to keep it going and then surprise us again. Um, so, so it seems like people are going to believe whatever they want to believe on this on this measure, but it seems strange to me when you talk about uh, civilization 2,000 years ago that you, you still have this thread running through society of people having this weird desire for the, for the world to end. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that goes back um, even to, uh, there's this book called uh, History Begins at Sumer by Samuel Noah Kramer, who is a, a Sumerian specialist. <clears throat> and he finds like that everything that we think, uh, every genre of thing you can find, it began, in, well, not necessarily began in Sumer, but you can find examples of it in ancient Sumer, in ancient Sumerian uh, texts. Uh, one of which is apocalypticism. He says, like, the world is so horrible, it's got to end. Uh, goes all the way back uh, to that time. And, um, you know, the uh, Persian Zoroastrianism, which uh, comes out of what is now Iran, uh, that was another apocalyptic worldview that spread west. And actually, when they conquered the regions that basically they ruled over the Jews, <clears throat> their apocalyptic views bled into Judaism. So Judaism became an apocalyptic religion, basically emulating a lot of the features of, um, of Zoroastrianism at the time. And that, that's when Judaism picked up the dualism, uh, good versus evil. There's a good God versus a evil slash, not really God, but, you know, superior supernatural being, Satan in this case. Uh, the idea of uh, end times resurrection of all the faithful, an idea of, like, these kinds of things uh, actually were Zoroastrian. They were Persian religion, pagan views that got uh, assimilated and, and drawn into Judaism, and then Judaism was transformed by it. And then, of course, because Christianity is a sect of Judaism, it borrowed all that stuff and went on and became yet another apocalyptic religion. Islam, of course, is just an offshoot of, essentially it is a, a form of, uh, uh, it's kind of a Jewish Christianity, because halal is very similar to uh, kosher. And so it's basically, and so it borrowed all of this apocalyptic imagery, and so they're apocalyptic. So there's a lot of these apocalyptic religions 
Many are not. Like, Taoism and Buddhism aren't apocalyptic, for example. But the Western tradition has become very like this. And I think the reason is that we've we've been experiencing, first of all, civil, the growth of civilization, um, which is really large and confusing and out of control. It's beyond us. It's, 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 uh, and, and a lot of result, well, things, bad things result from it. You get war, you get crime, you get uh, poverty and all of this stuff. And so people get very disappointed by the system that, that's leaving all of this misery. They can't fix the system because they don't control it. Uh, and even if they do control it, they usually have bad ideas how to fix it and it just makes it worse. Uh, and so you have this this feeling of hopelessness that we're, we're, we're just hopeless victims of this horrible system that's perpetuating violence and crime and, and, and misery and poverty and war and all this stuff. And, and wouldn't it just be nice if we could just destroy it all, just wipe it all clean and start over with some sort of paradise? And so that's why you even get now, like in fiction, you get these post-apocalyptic narratives that are not religious based so you know, you've got the zombie narrative you've got the you know the road warrior narrative and stuff and, and people have this sort of like a sort of reverse nostalgia for oh wouldn't that be a simpler time you know like we just get rid of the whole system and just live the way we want and I think that is an, a perpetually attractive because the world keeps getting denser population keeps getting more complex keeps getting ch keeps changing faster than people can keep up and they don't feel in control of it. And so I think apocalypticism is comforting because it makes them feel like, okay, okay, something's going to come and solve all of this and make it right. Uh, we just have to like just completely tear down the whole system and replace it. And if, and, and if God is good and, and all-powerful, then he can definitely, he's the one, he's the candidate who will make it right, uh, who will actually fix it. He's the one who can fix it. And so I think these beliefs are existentially comforting to people, Whereas if they were to abandon these beliefs, it becomes more discomforting to admit that, yeah, well, actually the world is just chaotic and out of control a little bit, uh, and there isn't anything we can do about it except, you know, be a good citizen and, and try our, our small bit to steer it in a good direction. Um, but that, that requires a very sort of uh, a sobering view of how the world works. And I, I think a lot of people would rather run away from that. It's the same reason why people don't want to admit their own mortality. They all want to believe they're going to live forever. So they invent these these mythologies that assure them that they are going to be resurrected in heaven for all eternity or something like that. People don't want to confront their own mortality uh, rather than just, okay, we need to cope with mortality and then use that as information about how should we live this one life we have because this is the only life we get. Um, and so I think the, the people get attached to these views because they're comforting and they don't really want to think about, they don't want to do the hard work, the philosophical work of dealing with the truth. I see this a lot in our politics. So when we poll on these sorts of apocalyptic views, I mean, we wind up with really high numbers of people who today, you know, have, have, have these views coloring how they view mainstream politics. So, there are polls about Donald Trump where one recently said 20% of the country thinks he's scarier than the devil. I think 20 some odd percent said Obama was the antichrist. I think 20% or more said Hillary Clinton was a demon. And then it went around on the internet that she smelled like sulfur because she just came from hell um, to get us. So it's, so a lot of this stuff is sort of there and people apply it in weird ways that, right. oh my God, it's the, you know, the Antichrist is here now. This means, you know, the, the big break is about to happen. And, 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 you know, and maybe that does explain, as you say, why we, you know, have these weird fascinations with, you know, zombie attack and, uh, you know, zombie apocalypse and, 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 and the end of the world that, that maybe it does wash clean all the things we don't like. And, and it's nice to think it's going to happen now. Yeah, and it's simple. That's the thing is, is human brains evolved to like two things, um, simplicity and certainty. So ambiguity is very uncomfortable. Uncertainty is very uncomfortable. Complexity, messiness are very uncomfortable. We like simple, straightforward, black and white solutions to things. And, uh, and on apocalypse, like let's just, just destroy it all, and then you can just start over with simple stuff and rebuild. It's a very alluring, it's inherent in our evolved psychology that we would find this attractive. It's profoundly irrational from an objective perspective because that people don't realize how much they benefit from and depend on the complexity of their civilization. I mean, just the fact that your bathroom works. <laughs> you think of the massively complex infrastructure, both politically and physically, that has to exist for your toilet to flush correctly and not fill up with 
poop. <laughs> you know, for, <laughs> right, for you to be like this horrible, uh, literally, you know, poop house. So that you're, you know, just, just something is, that's just one thing of like thousands of things that we depend on. The fact that the roads work, the fact that they get plowed uh, when we need to drive somewhere, you know, when there's snow, you know, it's like... Uh, People don't realize how much they depend. Uh, the, the clean water, their availability of clean water, people take that for granted. Uh, that was not a typical thing. Um, our ability to cr- improve sanitation and things like that. Um, just the fact that we can breathe. Uh, you know, most people don't live in Beijing and don't know what it's like to live in a massively polluted environment. Or they didn't live in like 1830, you know, downtown London, which, you know, was smelled horrible because uh, of sewage and horses. Uh, and, you know, all of that stuff. People take for granted uh, the things that they live. They don't realize the complex infrastructure that exists underneath that actually makes their lives better in these ways. Um, and so, and, and then you can't just wipe it all out and build from the simplicity because you're going to have even bigger problems when you don't have all those infrastructure, when you don't have police, when you don't have, uh, you know, uh, a culture that is anti-corruption and things like this. So if you, if you just start to build up from simplicity, you're basically talking about starting over as savages. And uh, we actually have history of what that was like, and it wasn't so great. So, um, but people don't think that through. Like, it, it's, it just seems simple. Just wipe it all clean, and then we can just build up from, from nothing. Um, it's comforting because it does hit that sort of simple black and white view of the world that, that is comforting for our brains, but it doesn't correspond to how things will actually happen. Well, what a great interview. Richard, we are out of time, but now for, for the listeners, um, tell them how to, they can find any of your information or work or maybe contact you. Well, everything you can find about me and all of all my work and other things is at uh, richardcarrier.info. That's richardcarrier.info on the web. That's my website. <clears throat> you can follow me on Facebook from there. You can follow me on Twitter from there. Um, you can find out about the classes I teach. I teach online courses every month. Um, <clears throat> you can check out all my books, uh, look and buy them there. You can read my blog. You can follow my blog. Uh, so all of the stuff that you would want uh, to find out about me and learn more about me are through richardcarrier.info.info. Great. Thank you. And, of course, we'll have it linked on our website, so people listening through the website can just uh, do one click and uh, find Richard. So again, Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much for being on the show, Richard Carrier. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well... Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. 